What's up, guys, and welcome back to the Fuse Life podcast, where I host guests with specialized knowledge and experience in the world of back pain. Today's guest seen his body basically completely destroyed by a vehicle accident and found the strength and the drive to get back to where he is just above the rim dunking the basketball. Um, with that said, let me introduce best-selling author of the book Basketball Strength, David Lemanchek. David, how you doing? Great, brother. Thanks for having me on today. This is such an exceptional honor. I've been waiting for this platform just to be able to have this specialized dialogue so we can help as many people as possible who are suffering through that perspective of surgery, the reality of the surgery, and then the aftermath of living with the changes of the surgery. Yeah, you're speaking the language of basically every subscriber to my channel. Um, you know, I I don't have a lot of subscribers. I think it's around 3,000 now, but these people are very active in terms of emailing me, um, commenting, and they do take in a lot of my content because of stuff like this. It's, you know, I'm not some pharma guy trying to push something on you. I've been through this and it's real. Right. And so have you. And that's, Definitely what I want to get out there with this. That's an amazing thing. And um, I have to tell you, since I've been through it, and um, in 2015 was when it began, it changed my whole perspective on life. I consider myself a very tough individual, more mentally and spiritually than physically. And uh, this really tested everything in ways that, I really wasn't ready. I got to be completely honest with you, brother. And um, it was only when I, I got in there and really in there deep that I realized how hard and how smart I was going to have to do consistently work with absolutely no letdown and no days off, no matter how bad it, it may seem. And some days it was pretty bad, brother. We'll get into that too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. And, uh, the thing is, is that when, when we go through that experience and then we're able to come out, it's a blessing in itself. Now to be able to talk about it and encourage others to take steps in their recovery, which are specific to the spine and, and the fusion process. Um, and if you don't mind, let's, let's just get right into it. Sure. Let's do it. With the accident, um, Going into the accident, brother, I was about 228 pounds, maybe something like 5 or 6% body fat, very high level of fitness, very happy, just overall high quality of life. Um, working as a teacher, as a coach, as a professional trainer, as an author, running camps, just a very active individual, a father. Um, and then I'm sitting at a traffic light on my way to summer school where I teach meditation. I teach health education. And what I do is I teach meditation. I'm sitting at a light. And the next thing I know is I get hit from behind, lose consciousness. When I regain consciousness, there's a packed intersection. There's cars everywhere. But there's a car behind me. And it's much larger and it's like lodged into my car. It's trying to move away. I can't figure out what's going on because my head's shaking. My arms are involuntarily moving. Something's wrong here. Something's wrong here. Something's definitely wrong with my knee. I don't know what the hell just happened to my back. And I'm trying to figure out what happened. And I don't know where I am. But then I start figuring out, oh, wait, I'm going to summer school. I just got hit wait, I have a phone. I took out my phone and I took a picture of the hit and run. How about this? She tries to leave. Took a picture and then I called 911. Have no recollection of me calling 911. Operator saying 911, what's your emergency? And um, again, I, I remember this months after, but I was saying, I thought I was just having a conversation. I didn't realize that I called 911. Then I actually realized what was happening after maybe some time. I said, I've been in an accident, sitting in an intersection. This car's driving away. 
officers actually found this car and pulled her to the side of the road because she wasn't able to get away. It was a, it was a five lane intersection and she was trying to get away across four lanes and up onto a sidewalk. She was driving with a suspended license with a two-year-old in the back seat, texting on her phone and hit me going 35 in an SUV. I'm a school teacher teaching meditation, stopped at a red light. And in an instant, everything changed. I didn't know where I was and I had some serious permanent damage. I knew I wasn't mortally damaged, um, but I didn't realize the extent of the damage until kind of time had gone on. Um, the whole thing with the accident was a complete blur. Again, it was only like months later that I actually would remember and start to piece together things like the officer was trying to speak to me and was telling me what she said. And that I was almost like too out of the situation to even communicate. But I said, just look at my car. And I was hit from behind. And it's as simple as that. Just do what you have to do. And I need to get, you know, medical help. So what had happened is I got the medical evaluation and the toll was like, it was tremendous. I had, um, and L4, L5, S1, pars fracture all the way through, spondylolisthesis grade two to three. So how it was explained to me is no one is going to touch your spine because the moment they cut it open because of the fracture, the bones are going to move. And with it, your spinal cord might get cut. So this was the risk. So I got strung along by a neurosurgeon for a couple of months who just wanted to make money off epidurals. And I figured out that scam right away, too. And that pissed me off because I'm like, listen, I'm an honest man doing an honest thing, trying to get better. And if you want to make money, I have no problem with anybody making money. Just don't try to screw me over and other people while you're doing it. And guess what? I know what the hell you're doing. Guess what? I'm tougher than you. And I'm going to stand up and talk about you and what you're doing to you. And then I'm going to stand up on a box and tell everyone else about what the hell you're doing. It's called the standard of care and it sucks. So once I found somebody that would operate, it was as simple as me saying, I trust you, you can do it, but tell me what's going to happen, <laughs> right? So let's back up. So that was the that was the back. The neck, I had two levels that moved 15 degrees outside the normal curve. And it was something like, you know, 10% loss of longevity, they said. I'm like, I don't care what you say. I'm going to increase 10% of longevity. Yep. So the neck, I said, I'm not getting surgery. I'll find a way to rehab it. Still working with my way through it. The shoulder was almost a complete tear through the labrum, anterior, posterior, just kind of whipped all the way through during that hit. And that was rough. My right knee the medial meniscus tore because when I got hit, I tried to push the brake down to stop my car. And I pushed, 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 and then it just gave way, tore, and that was that. So that one I actually had to rehab. That's an actually cool story that we'll talk about later, how I was able to move that knee within one day, walk within one week, and run within two. And that's never done in America. It's something done outside because of the standard of care. Wow. So the operation, um, I want to talk about the anxiety mm -hmm. related to that. I was very scared when I got hit because I felt the bones busted up in my back and I couldn't stand up. It's a strange thing when you've been hit in the back and it's actually damaged. You can't stand up like I'm sitting here now. It's because of the fusion. I mean, you know, you have it. and It keeps you. It doesn't move. <laughs> it's just the way it is. So with that, not being able to stand up, and I could actually feel a hole in my back created by that spondy. And I had a therapist who was like, oh, I get that spondy back in there. You just, you're not really working that hard. The spondy, the spondy. He's talking to me like this. And I'm like, listen, I'm going to be really upfront and respectful with you. I'm going to kick your ass if you talk to me like this. You don't know what the F you're talking about. I'm just going to be honest with you. I, I have confidence in people, man. I like people that are like, yo, I can help you because I'm that way too. But when you have structural damage, you have to get the integrity right. It's like, why would we put a building 
on a foundation that is not properly set. It has to be level. And then from there, there's a series of parameters that we have to take care of with the framing in order to make sure it's going to withstand the weight that we want to put on it, floor by floor. It's simple. The body is the same. So once I've realized that month by month, I'm not being operated on, my body's atrophying, bones started to move. So I went from about 220 to about 173 quick. Wow. And that was scary, brother. I'm not going to lie. During that time, they're feeding me opiates by, you know, like Skittles. You know, take these. Take these. <clears throat> I'm out of work. Uh, you know, I'm taking these Skittles, which are opiates. I'm getting addicted to these things. Not realizing that half the time I'm waking up nauseous, it's actually the detox from the opiates. So now I'm dealing with this addiction, which becomes more of a problem than me figuring out how I'm going to recover from a surgery that no one wants to do. <laughs> then I have to go to these independent medical examiners who are all trying to screw me over and tell me that I didn't get hurt in a car accident, that I got hurt somewhere else. And I'm looking at this whole charade like, listen, I know you need to make money. <laughs> Here we go again. I want you to make money. Stop trying to screw me over. Mm -hmm. Then I started to realize that the standard of care is really about using people for this business medicine pharmacological practice that completely screws people over. And within 10 years, most of the people that are on the opiates are dead. Mm -hmm. Fentanyl is a death sentence. Yep. And most of the people that I sat in pain management centers with are dead. There's no way they're alive. I had the conversations with these people. Mm -hmm. We spoke about the practices, what they're doing, the alternatives even. And they knew, but it was too deep. They're in too deep. And that's it. And that's all. And that sucks. But to be completely blunt, and why not just keep being that way? It can change. So what I found is there are people who will do operations when they're necessary. You just have to find them. Yep. But, but before you you do those operations, you really have to prepare yourself for a very challenging work ahead. At 39, I had to learn a brand new spine, mm -hmm. you know, at three levels at a critical point in the lumbar, I'm fused up. And I was told by the doctor that did the fusion, walking will happen for you, athletics the way you know, Absolutely no way. Basketball, no way. Um, most likely, permanent. you're permanently disabled. You'll probably be on disability. I don't expect you to go back to work. And I was like, it's absolutely not happening. Appreciate it. Log that down in your notes so when I break your notes, you can actually see that, all right, this is what I assessed him as. Mm -hmm. This is what happened. This is where he went. Like, I just want you to keep it as an anecdotal. So I went week by week, week by week, then month by month to see him. And what happened is I get cleared to walk a lap around a track. I think this is some like maybe four or five months post-surgery, which was a nine-hour reconstruction. Mm -hmm. I was videotaped by an insurance company and all my benefits were cut and I was sent back to work. Now, I was working at an alternative school for psychiatric kids who were very physically aggressive. And guys like me are needed in that place. Yeah. Period, end of story. It's obvious why. If it's not obvious why, I'm 6'4", 240 pounds, lifetime martial artist, and I know how to defend and keep people safe when they're unsafe. Plus, I'm a licensed teacher. There it is. Yeah. Guess what? Went back to the environment. I should have been dead. Those kids had so much respect for me. None of them would even think about fighting in my room mm -hmm. or even uttering a word. They'd go anywhere else. They were like, listen, Lamanchek, he's a real one. Leave him alone. He's recovering. Fight anywhere else. And I, I was scared, man, because I couldn't even sit up. Yeah. And I, I had to go back to work. <laughs> right. So I got to drive an hour. I got to teach seven hours. I got to come home an hour. Right. Then I recover. And then all these things happen with recovery. Like I teach in the city. 
that I'm a phys ed teacher, a health teacher, and a coach. My first three years teaching in the city, I couldn't stand up. I was teaching phys ed, leaning against the wall. Mm -hmm. All the kids thought I was being cool. I couldn't stand up, man. Yep. I was actually leaning for life and just having good conversation because I'm a likable and relatable person that just knows how to connect, you know? So let's get back to how do we help people to handle the anxieties of knowing they have to get a surgery that's gnarly as hell, that they're going to use power torque wrenches to get the job done. Yeah. And if you're like me, they roll you into a cafeteria with tile floor and tile walls, white ceilings, long cafeteria tables with saws and tools that you can see. And they put you on a slab knowing exactly what's going to happen. I was bugging out. I'm like, when are you going to put me out? And when I started really losing it, I was like, I swear, if you don't, <laughs> then I was like, <laughs> and when I woke up, Laura Cunningham was there. And Laura, if you hear it, you're, you're, you're an angel, man, because I haven't seen this girl <clears throat> maybe 25 years. She's friends with a lot of the kids I grew up with and a sister to a kid, Kevin Cunningham, good, um, good kid, also conductor on Long Island Railroad. Let's get back to it. She sees me. Don't move. I'm like, why? Hey, I wanted to give her a hug and a kiss. I haven't seen you in so long. She's like, no, your back just got fused up. Three levels, nine hour surgery. Don't move. It was the most pain I ever felt in my life. They had to let the pain management medicine, the drip kind of go down to zero before they give me anything more. Wow. I didn't really know about pain until that moment. Mm -hmm. And um, I went heavily into prayer. And at that point, I was just asking God to show me exactly what I needed to see in order to understand the situation. And at that point, it was like a viewfinder from the 70s when you used to have that little thing and you would press it and it would go around and you'd see the little shots. I had snapshots of my mom taking care of me as a kid, just showing me love in different developmental ways. Her showing me to Jesus, her showing me to God, her showing me forgiveness, her showing me patience, her showing me how to walk. I like witness all these things. And I'm like, oh, that's it. I got to do it all over again. I actually have to do it all over again. I have to, first, I have to forgive this person who did this to me. Mm -hmm. Then I have to forgive the standard for trying to destroy me. Then I have to, man, you know what? I got to forgive me too. I have to do a good job of healing right now. And then I have to help as many people as I can to get through addiction, to get through a surgery, to get healthy so that they can live their life and be happy. Because ultimately, brother, it's, we want to wake up on default happy. Yeah, That's a key. Yeah, if we can do that and like you're not thinking about your back and pain, they'd, they'd ask me, it's like, Dave, how's pain today? And this is before surgery. I'd be like, seven. They'd be like, just a seven? I'm like, a difference is I know what the hell the number scale is. Seven, I need surgery. Eight, I'm in the hospital. You know, like people are like, oh, I got a headache. It's a nine. I'm like, right. bro, no, it's not. No, you got a three. And I think you need to understand the pain scale. So, so the pain scale is something that I learned. And what I've become an expert on now is pain management through joint manipulation, which is the training that I do in basketball strength is a segue for the healing that I do. It's almost like how old school martial artists were first, like, let's say we'll pick Kung Fu, for example, last 11 years, I do Kung Fu. Mm -hmm. So Kung Fu martial artists would evolve. And as they evolve and as they get older, they become healers. Some of them become energy practitioners like Qigong masters. Other become traditional Chinese med uh, medical practitioners like TCM, acupuncturists. Some of them a blend. For me, it became healing training healing like that cycle so now now that i've healed and now my head's at the rim it's crazy i can't even believe what the hell's happened now but i believe it you see it i see it every day i pray i can't believe it's happening but it is it's the forum for me to show 
that it can be done. And, and it is horrible to have your back busted up. It's, it's a terrible experience. It hurts beyond anything. One thing that no one knows about, <clears throat> I'm claustrophobic, are you? Brother, <laughs> I have internal claustrophobia because I can't get out of a cage. Now, this is something that I could not prepare for, but this is something that I have to do extra work on every day because it bugs me out. Who can relate to that? It's like we right. go in the MRIs and that sucks. No one wants an MRI, man. It's a weird thing. But imagine having an internal one, you know, like <laughs> you get it, you got it. Um, and that's the thing. My greatest fear is claustrophobia. And now I live with it every day. You know, you, you have to face your fears head on. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so for me, it's wake up. And as soon as my eyes open up, I, I can feel the steel without moving. Okay. All right. So it's an acceptance, right? It's those childhood lessons coming back of being grateful. Sure. I, I'm here. I'm alive. I can help. Me and you are having this talk and we're going to help people understand that if they have structural damage, they need help. And after the structural damage is repaired, you can recover and you can do incredible things. There is you one thing I have... wanted to touch on, uh, Dave. I, I don't mean to interrupt you because you got a great flow. Um, but when you talk about the little things like that, when you wake up from surgery and you start the healing process, you don't care what was going on at work. You don't care about these, you know, these outside problems. It's like you said, I'm alive. And then, you know, a couple of days I can walk. Uh, you know what I'm saying? I mean, the, the little things mean so much and it's just so humbling to, to have the surgery and come out the other end. Um, I mean, it's, you said it perfectly. Um, there was a couple other things I wanted to touch on was the, um, the fentanyl you talked about. It's, you know, I live in the Midwest and that's just mm -hmm. an absolute scourge here in the Midwest. I mean, there's people overdosing every day. The, the clinics, um, what, what do you call them? Where, where, uh, oh, the recovery, um, I, I'm, I'm missing the, the word. Clinics. Yeah. Yeah. The clinics, it, they, they don't seem to help. It's like, brother, you know, listen to this. My yeah. mother brought me into one when I was four. She used to be a substance abuse counselor here in, in Long Beach. Mm -hmm. I'm like, mommy, what is this place? She goes, I want you to look at heroin. So I come in and there's a guy we all strung out and he look at me and he's like, look at me, little boy. And I'm like, I didn't want to look. I don't want to look. My mom's like, look at him. I'm like, mom. She goes, no, look. I looked at him. This guy's face. I'll never forget. Crazy looking guy. He's like, you see me, little boy? And I just turned around scared. I walked away. My mom, I looked up at my mom. I'm like, mom, why would you? She goes, DJ, that's heroin. Yep. And I looked at her and I go, okay. So what you're talking about, fentanyl, is about 100 times stronger than that. Mm-hmm. So how do we, how do we like, how do we even contemplate or put that in as a standard when it's a hundred times stronger than battlefield medicine in World War II? Right, right. So how do, how is that done? And 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 like, how do we fight the standard to shift focus into healing instead of killing? Sure, and and you know what, I I don't want to get political with it, but you can't. There, there's no fighting big pharma companies. There's no, I mean, I don't want to mention the companies and stuff like, but there, I mean, there's just no fighting, you know? Um, right. They're too big. They're too big. They have too much money. They're too powerful. Um, right. And, you know, I, I have heard, you know, on like Joe Rogan podcasts and stuff, people talking about, you know, there's only two countries allowed to actually advertise um, prescription medications, and that's the U.S. and New Zealand. And that's for good reason that countries don't allow the advertising. I mean, doctors are getting kickbacks for, you know, right. giving chemotherapy medicine that fails 97% of the time. You know, it's just, I don't want to go down the political path, but the standard of care you talked about yep. is, uh, it, it definitely, it definitely hits home because for sure, when I was going through the, um, you know, my back issues, I went to a doctor who I told him I'm having big time disc issues and it was just take a pill take this shot. Oh no, get an x-ray. Now I don't need an x-ray. I need an MRI. I've got disc issue. That was like the fourth or fifth thing when I'm telling him that, you know, and I'm not a doctor. They are, but I'm telling them this is what I'm feeling. I've had disc issues my whole life. This is just worse than any other one. 
And it's just one of those things where you got to make money off the insurance. Everybody's trying to scam somebody and, it, and it's a shame. And there's a lot of money to be made. And here's the thing. A couple of my friends are physicians and they showed me the back end and the money that's made. Yeah. Brother, there's a lot of money being made anyway. And I get it. But when you double, triple and quadruple it for a, a sham job. Yeah. All right. So, so political stuff, we stay outside, but check this out. Awareness is where we go. Uh-huh. So when we know that something's going on and it stinks, we let people know. And then, we let them know that the show must go on and healing will take place. So even though the standard of care exists, we still have to operate within that standard. We just don't actually, it's like getting a menu. You don't order everything on the menu. It's just like what you want. And then if it comes and there's certain things you don't like with that plate, you don't eat, you know? So it's that kind of thing. And that's what we do. We're educated consumers of this system. We use this system instead of the system using us. That's the difference. So as educated consumers and using a system, we use it to benefit us and to help one another to find resources to not only advocate for ourselves, but for each other. So like the number one epidemic out there, it's gotta be addiction. And it's got to be related to opioids. Yep. And in that, you you have it going in all different directions with people making bad decisions, driving to domestic violence, to law enforcement getting involved with different infractions taking place. Like it's a problem. And where does it start? A lot of times with a acute injury or maybe a chronic thing. Yep. So there's other ways to go about it. <clears throat> with the fusion, I wake up every day in pain. Mm-hmm. I have spasms all the time. I have to constantly stretch just to stay above what I believe water. I will, again, I'm just grateful to be here, but there's very big challenges that go into it and a lot of work. Um, so let me ask you, how do you prepare somebody else? Like when they come up to you, if they ask you like, hey man, how how do I prepare myself? For, for the spinal fusion that's coming up? Like, what would you say to them? Well, I, I'm always careful to, I'm not promoting a spinal fusion. And, and the reason I'm not promoting it is I want you to explore all options first. If that leads you down the path to where you need a fusion, then I'll start preparing you for the fusion. And how I would prepare you for that is, I mean, I feel like I'm so lucky. I feel like you have to have so many things go your way. And, and the first thing is the doctor has to do a good job. If the doctor doesn't do a good job, then nothing I tell you is, is going to be worth anything. Right. So you, you have to have some luck with this. And that's another reason I'm not promoting somebody chopping up your spine. Um, but if you have to get it done, you, you have to have a mindset going into it. And you talked a little bit about this. Before I had the surgery, I remember there was a night where I couldn't, I mean, I was just laying on the ground. I couldn't get up um, on, a, on a mattress on the ground. I'd sleep on the floor because that's the only thing that was comfortable for me at the time. And I remember crying almost all night thinking, I'm not going to be able to throw a football with my kids. I'm going to be in a wheelchair. And then, you know, that actually snapped me out of it to like, I'm getting this surgery. There's no way out of this, but I'm coming out the other end better than I went in. And mm-hmm. that's just what it was. You have to have the mindset. If you don't have the mindset, you're done right there. Right. So indomitable will. And and then you have to have the wisdom. I mean, so I got the surgery and I'm getting a call two days after surgery saying you need to come in for physical therapy. And I said, what are you talking about? I can't drive. I this, It's two days after you want me to go to physical therapy. I said, no, I'm not doing it. So, you know, right there was that was kind of a hint to me, like, there's something wrong. Either the people aren't on the same page, they don't know what they're doing, or like we talked about, it's some sort of a scam. So I'm going to do all the research I can myself, and I'm going to take this thing slow. I'm going to heal, then I'm going to work a little bit, then I'm going to heal, then I'm going to work a little bit, and just kind of feel my body out and see where I'm at at the time. And I decided to vlog all that stuff on this channel to try and give people some sort of not a path or it's not like a, 
it's kind of a guide, I would say, just just a loose guide. This is what I did. This is how I got past it. But you need to feel it out for yourself, how your body's right. doing. Um, but I'm, I'm definitely an advocate to stay off the pain meds. I stopped them immediately after I got home. I stopped immediately. It's the only way to do it. Um, and, yes, and the pain was horrible. But I had to cut off the pain meds and just fight through that pain. And it's it's like you said, it's a fight every single day. So mm -hmm. I don't wake up in pain right now, but I do wake up where my back is stiff. You know, I'll go down the stairs, my back's stiff, and then it takes a second to, you know, get back to feeling normal. And I do have to stretch every night. I do uh, do dead hangs on the uh, squat rack back here. I'll hang there 30 seconds, 45 seconds, whatever it is to just kind of um, elongate the spine and allow the discs to rest a little bit. I do do the, um, the cold plunges. I have a, 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 a steam sauna and all that stuff helps. And I use it almost every day because mm -hmm. it keeps me normal. So to answer your question, um, I would just, you have to prepare somebody for it. It's a long fight ahead. You can do it, but it's a right. long fight ahead. <laughs> That's an amazing story, man. I can relate to so much of that. It's, <laughs> it, you know, it's directly relatable. A lot of the rehab that I did was in water. I would go into a shallow end of a pool, mm -hmm. uh, four feet. And that's where I did all my movement. So I learned how to walk again, jog again, gallop, slide, skip, hop, all the locomotion that we did in elementary school. I took it back because I decided to make this recovery into you are learning all over again, everything. And then what ended up happening is it was a very incremental, slow process. But like you, once I cut out the pain medication, went through the detox, got into the water, which was also pretty relaxing too. My body started to heal. When you're in water, the body can get away from gravity. So it begins to kind of relax, heal itself while you do the work. And then what I realized is once I felt confident in my body, instead of jumping on land, just jump in the water. So then I started sprinting in the water. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that the athleticism carryover was almost infinite. And that it's really something that no one's doing, but something that should be focused on immediately because athletic performance, especially explosiveness, is a huge field and a sought after skill. Do it in the water. <laughs> it's that simple. So mm -hmm. think me going through this process helped me to learn how to identify more with structural damage and integrity problems. Mm -hmm. Like for me, it wasn't a choice to get a surgery. It was who can do it and when, because the structure was, it was over. Mm -hmm. Um, for structural damage, you have to get that taken care of. And like you said, there's there's great opportunity to look around the world, actually. They actually they do some really interesting things in Russia where they don't fuse the spine. What happens? Do you know what they do over there? No, I don't. It's actually pretty cool. Just imagine um, you know, like building blocks. You have each vertebrae is a block, but instead of it being fused with Harrington rods going parallel and then plate space or screws binding it all. What they are, believe it or not, is blocks that can turn every way that our spine already turns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's amazing. It just reinforces what's already there. So I think it, it matters on how much you have existing in terms of the structural integrity before they can put that together. But I almost went over to Russia and had this done. Um, the only reason why I didn't, and this is the sad part of the story, but true, is I lost touch with a friend of mine who was working for the Russian Federation when he went into Crimea. And we all know what happened in Crimea. Mm -hmm. So that was around that time. Rest in peace if that's what happened. I don't know. But a lot of crazy things are happening in this world, brother. Yeah. And we stayed on top by knowing what's best. So you made a comment about doctors and you not being one. I can definitely give you the nod that your knowledge of self is greater than any doctor because you know what yourself feels like. And those internal alarm systems that all go off when something's out of whack, like a disc 
automatically it's circuitry that goes along and it lets you know what the signs are. You just follow them all the way back. You detect the inflammation, mm -hmm. the structural integrity that's compromised, and right away you have your answer. So I think that us being knowledgeable on our anatomy and physiology is a priority because it helps us to understand how we can heal ourselves and then advocate for ourselves. Like if we have to go to a physician as part of the standard of care, we should go and use them like a tool for a service that we need instead of us going to a physician and saying, can you help me? Right. No, we go there because I know how you help me. This is how you help me. Mm -hmm. And it's not a perspective that physicians want, but it's one that could, they're going to get from people who are informed and yeah. who understand that, okay, I care about myself. Like when I went to the doctor who wouldn't operate on me, he gave me three epidurals mm -hmm. inside of three months. And then he's like, you know what? I'll see you in January. I'm like, why? And then I was like, oh, because you can only do three in a calendar year. So this is that game that you're playing. Meanwhile, I lost 42 pounds and my spine's atrophying. You're going to play this game for how long? Then I looked and the last time I got, I'm at this hospital, you got 17 people lined up to get epidurals. I know exactly how much money this guy's making. And everybody's like, thank you so much. You're doing such a great job. And this guy's walking around like, like I'm not impressed. I, I know what you're doing. Yep. And that's not healing. Healing is deep spiritual work, breath work, flexibility work, decompression work. You do yours with a dead hang. I have an inversion table right behind the camera. Yep. Those things are essential. All right, Dave, when I cut you off there, you were talking about a bunch of people lined up for um, epidurals. And I kind of have a relatable story for that. So I took my son to the dentist and he was only like seven years old at the time. And they told me, yeah, he's got these, uh, he's got cavities. He needs these caps on his, you know, back, back four molars on top. And I didn't think anything of it. Right. You know, whatever, a thousand bucks, 1500 bucks here, there, they're nickel and diamond you with all this crap. And then, you know, the next time we visit, I see two or three kids come out with the same thing. And I'm thinking, huh, there's just, there's just no way. And then we go back again and it's like, they're recommending this for everyone, no matter who you are, no matter what problem you have. And we've been had, you know, I, I talked to my wife and she, she actually noticed that first, she's like, we've been had, they're doing this to everybody. Uh -huh. And you know, that, that uh, dentist office does not operate today because I think they were found out. And I think, you know, they were shut down because they were just doing it to everybody, no matter what. So I can mm -hmm. definitely relate to what you were saying. Mm. They try to string people along. They really do. I'll tell you what they can't do. They can't defeat the indomitable will of a person. Yeah. When you have the fire that burns and you understand it, mm -hmm. sure, man, you, you can have a setback. And you had a setback. <clears throat> Pardon me. I had a setback. But even when your body doesn't move, inside your mind's eye, you can see mm -hmm. the vision and what you're going to do. So even those moments, man, when I was laying in bed, immobile, not able to do anything, I was seeing today. I was seeing yep. jumping up with that basketball, crushing it over the rim when everyone told me it wasn't possible. You know, everyone counted me out. Mm -hmm. The doctors counted me out. I had a bunch of friends who ended up being fake and they counted me out. Yep. But the list was so long and <clears throat> top of the list of people that counted me in was me. Yep. I'll straight up say it. I, I believed in me. I, I believed that God would help me through this time. And brother, in the detox, which was the most intense thing of it all, I locked myself in a room. And on the 18th day, of cold turkey detox, I was naked in the tub, in the fetal, pleading for my life. Because at that point, I was legitimately contemplating suicide because I couldn't take it anymore. 18 days with no sleep and that detox was nuts. Mm -hmm. And this was diluted. So I'm losing it. And I just asked God in that moment, just please 
take this from me because I can't handle this burden anymore. There's nothing I can do. I'm not strong enough and I need you to take it. And at that point, I literally looked up in the ceil- to the ceiling in a dark room in a hot tub with no water and I was naked and witnessed a gleaming hand come down, touch my head, put me down. And there I stayed for about a minute. And when I opened my eyes and I felt the presence leave, that addiction was probably 50% gone. And it happened instantaneously. And that shifted the course of my life very dramatically. People that knew me from a long time ago will see me now and automatically will say, what happened to you? Because the only way people act like the way you're acting is if you almost died. Something very dramatic happened, like it, what happened? And here's the thing, when you go through a detox, Basketball Diaries by Leonardo DiCaprio, that depiction of the detox from cocaine was mild compared to what you actually go through because it's much longer. It's not a minute, it goes on for months, sometimes years. And it's never really over. It's a thing that you're constantly going to have to battle and strive against. Mm -hmm. And that is the challenge that is not too much spoken about in recovery. It's more or less the nuts and bolts of structural integrity and how do we rehab. But I think if we can do a little bit better on the preparation to handle addiction, to say, like my mother was a substance abuse counselor and put programs into 126 schools in Long Island to identify children who are at risk of different types of abuse. So I had a different type of schooling. So like I told you with the methadone clinic and me, me witnessing that early, being knowledgeable will allow us to understand addiction when it happens. I realized when I was waking up nauseous that my body was in detox from opiates. I realized it right away. I had surgery on February 4th of 2016 on February 2nd. You ready for this? No fault insurance cut my benefits so I couldn't get surgery. If I didn't have private insurance, I wouldn't have been able to get surgery. These are the games that I'm playing. Yep. After after two months of being on Dilaudid, one of my best friends killed himself and downed a whole uh, prescription of oxys. And everyone seems to know somebody who unfortunately has committed suicide. Yep. And I know quite a few. And it's really sad because the common theme is opiates. So what did I do? Uh, Ten days? I I couldn't even go to his funeral because I was all strung out on dilaudid. What's it like when you can't go to your best friend's funeral because you're all strung out on drugs? Like, it's such a shameful thing. Mm -hmm. And on April 13th, which is the anniversary, anniversary of my grandpa's leaving of this earth, he visited me. And he said, DJ, today is the day. And I said, Grandpa, and I can't see him, but I can smell him. You know, I, he smells like this uh, garage that he used to bring me into and teach me all these knots and stuff. He was a Navy guy. So he's like, DJ, today's the day. I said, today's the day for what, Grandpa? He goes, today's the day it stops. Close the door. Close the door to all the pills. Open your heart to Jesus. It's over. And that's when it started. And on day 18, the hand came down. And then after that day, I opened the door and then um, I took very careful steps to know that we're all stones throw away from the worst nightmare possible. Yep. And and there's nothing anyone, and I mean anyone, can prepare you for your heart has to be ready before. And your heart has to be filled with love for the for the fear that's going to show itself, especially if you get deep into that addiction, then then the demons are going to come. And then it's an unexplainable thing. Like you have to have the love programmed in. And I've seen a lot of people have a difficult time coming out because it hasn't been put in right. And that's something that comes from early childhood, Mm -hmm. but there's always hope. And the hope is what you said. You have to stop. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Stop. Uh, you know, and, and you're an anomaly. This, what you're talking about, people, you know, getting rid of addiction. It's not, 
it's not probable. Like when you look at rehab uh, clinics, um, it's just, it's a high 90s percent fail rate. I mean, these people come out <laughs> and they're back on whatever it was again, and they're back on it even harder. You know, they relapse even harder, usually leading to eventual death, you know, sooner rather than later. And uh-huh. it's just your entire story is remarkable um, to, first of all, the vehicle accident to dunking a basketball. I mean, that that in itself is so amazing. The, the percentage chance of somebody doing that is just off the charts. I mean, if you're watching this, go right now and Google if you should play basketball after a spinal fusion. It's going to say no. It's going to say don't do jujitsu. Don't run. Don't work out. It's going to tell you basically don't do anything but die is is what it's going to tell you. So you have to figure it out on your own. And uh, Dave, I'm glad to have you on to explain some of this stuff because people, people that watch this channel, uh, they're going through it. I'm telling you, they're going through it. I get the emails all the time. They are going through it, man. And I've had people email me. I've had people call me that are contemplating suicide. I've had people tell me that my videos have helped them to see the light and, and help them not, you know, commit suicide. So yes, these, yeah, it's just, that's really important, brother. It's yeah. This, this stuff is more than, it's not about money. It's not about fame. It's about helping people. And that's just, damn right, man, it's, it's, it's some heavy stuff. Sometimes when you really think about people are watching, they're going to watch us talk and they're going to take something from this that might save their life, you know? Ten percent, and and that's why we're doing it. Mm-hmm. And once we do it, it's here for all time. Right. Yeah. So we we we've done. Two men have sat and had a difficult discussion about topics that a lot of people don't want to necessarily individually put themselves out of forum and speak about, but we're mm-hmm. comfortable because we have firsthand experience and know that people would benefit from hearing it. Yeah. So it's kind of like if we can give hope to someone that feels hopeless Mm -hmm. and then give encouragement directly, like you said, with the engagement that you have. That's amazing. I have similar engagement. And I have to tell you, when you can connect to somebody and help and know you did Mm -hmm. and actually know that the reason why they're still here is because of encouragement that you help them with. That is like Thanksgiving. Yep. Just to know at that level that you've actually helped a soul. Like for me, brother, money is a means to live. Mm -hmm. But the purpose of life is directly tied, tied to my soul, which is tied to your talent. I used to think my talent was athletics. My talent is helping people realize they don't have to give up. Mm -hmm. That's it. I do it through athletics, but really the talent is keep rising. That's why I say the sky is no limit. People used to tell me the sky's the limit, the sky's the limit. And I'm like, that thinking is wrong. They're like, what do you mean? I'm like, I don't have limits like you. So I'm not thinking like that. I won't even say that. So I shut it down right away. I say the sky is no limit. We're just going to keep going. Yep. We're going to create a new paradigm where we're going to give hope to the hopeless, support to the people that thought they had none, options for those who didn't know they could create them. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to put bodies back where we developed in the first place. We developed an amniotic fluid in utero. We're going to go back into the pool and develop all over again. We're going to get weightless. And then we're going to come out like we do. and We're going to decompress, stretch, get together in community. And with addiction, we don't erase addiction. We replace it. So for me a diluted opiate addiction was shifted into artwork and painting. Like I paint and draw and sculpt and do different things. Mm -hmm. And then I shifted that once I'd be able to be a little bit more mobile into some applications like physical exercise and athletics, but we cannot erase. 
we are a place. Mm -hmm. You know, Dave, I could tell within five seconds of talking to you that you are genuine and that your passion is people. And that was, seems to be instilled in you by your mother. Um, and you've just, after the, seems like after the vehicle accident and all this stuff happened, you've just 10 X that, and you're just, you're all in on people, helping people, helping people do the right thing. And it's really, it's really good to see. Cause you don't see that very often. Um, Amen. It's, just, it's just today's world is about trying to scam somebody, trying to take somebody's money, trying to hurt somebody. It's just not, you're not the norm. And, you know, you have such a good flow when you talk that I forget to uh, bring some things up. And I did want to bring up that anxiety you talked about when you were heading into surgery, because I didn't experience that. And the reason I didn't experience that is because I, the pain for me was so bad that I was, I was ready. I'm like, if, if it kills me, it kills me. I, I'm ready. There's nothing else I could do. I'm ready for it. So wow. yeah, it was, I was in a really bad spot at that time. And I, I just remember getting wheeled back and I was basically just emotionless. Like whatever happens, happens. I'm, I'm ready to die. If, if that's what happens here, like, I, I mean, the pain, people don't understand back pain until you have it. I mean, it's, it's the center of your universe. You can't move. <laughs> Without thinking about it, you you don't want to talk to anybody. You don't want to eat. You can't sleep. I mean, you have to get it fixed. And it was one of those things right. where it's time to get it fixed now. So I want you to talk about how you kind of dealt with it. Was it just your relationship with Jesus Christ? Or how were you able to deal with that anxiety of getting pushed into this room? And you see the saws right there that are going to cut you open. You know what's mm -hmm. about to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think um, that's a tough question to answer, and I'd like to go right direct to it. I, I started watching videos of the surgeries on YouTube so I could see exactly what they were going to try to do to me. And once I realized how they hold the body open, the type of torque wrenches they used, how much force is used, how they're literally just ripping the body around and yeah. it's being held in place by a slab and it's gnarly. And I'm like, wait a minute, this isn't a delicate, intricate process. This is more like this is rough, man. I mean, it, it's instrumentation for, for lack of better words. So what did I do? I watched the videos and then it bugged me out. Yeah. But me as a person, brother, what I do is if I'm afraid of something, I confront it until I'm not afraid of it until I'm comfortable being in the presence of the fear, but still having the fear. That's mm -hmm. my reality. I can't erase the fear. It's just, it's there. I just have to be present with it and be comfortable somewhat. So, I was unable to sleep for about two weeks before it, maybe like an hour or two. And it was only because I was passing out. It wasn't because I was like happily sleeping. I'd be like, eh, wake up hour later. Okay, here we go again, bug it out. Mm -hmm. And then um, that was it. I, I just bugged out. Time went by. And I kept on breathing. I would breathe and count. I would pray. I would breathe and count. I would pray. And that cycle just went on and on. And I really couldn't do much anything else because I was immobile. Mm -hmm. The day of the surgery, I had a seven o'clock surgery and the monitor, the person who operated the monitor was stuck in traffic. So it didn't happen until nine. I was very upset and I was yeah. issuing uh, expletives at about 830. Yeah. I held long enough. And um, by nine, they rolled me into that room and I'm, I'm looking at everything. And the last thing I said is I was like, I, I really wish you had enough respect to at least not show me what you're going to do to me. You know, and, and that visual, I will never in my life forget. That is an, it's a virtual nightmare. I don't ever want to see that. I hope no one ever sees what I saw. Mm -hmm. And um, chances are is that you will. Somebody will. Um, so what do you do? You have to understand if it is something that you need to do it's like you faced it because you knew it was pain that you were going to get that taken care of and then your structure was going to be intact and you're going to be all set for me same kind of thing so i knew i had to go ahead and do it yeah but it's scary it's scary man it's you know mm -hmm. they're going to take stuff out and they're going to put stuff in and you're going to be a different person period end of story Yep. Your body might accept it right away. Chances are it's not. And you're going to have to work your way through it to make your body adapt to it. 
Mm -hmm. right? I forced my body into a new level of adaptation that science can't even explain. I'm actually making my own rules as I go. And I don't even know how it goes. It's just going. Yeah. So what'll happen is I'll end up being some sort of case study just to prove that things can be done. And they better put that main ingredient in there, which is Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. They better put that ingredient in there because I'm not jumping with my head over the rim. Mm-hmm. Unless my Lord and Savior delivers me from that evil. And on the 18th day, when that hand came down, amen, here we are. And that's not, this isn't happening without that. Like this, this offering that I've been able to put together and help some people with would never be that without yeah. God. It would not be here. Like it's, it's all secondary without that healing. And I think if, Somebody doesn't necessarily believe in God or, or Jesus Christ, but they believe in a higher power. You're going to get it done that way. We can't do it alone. Yep. We need a higher power. And then after a higher power, it's like we have this community. We need community. That's what we do. Human mm-hmm. beings are community species. We thrive together. We survive alone. Yep. You know, it's we need to thrive, instill this community, reinforce hope, create new categories Mm -hmm. so that when we experience setbacks and injuries, we could say, hey, man, this is what happened back in the day. But, Mm -hmm. yo, we can try this now. We can do this. You know, like I I wasn't hearing that doctor telling me you're never going to slam dunk again. I'm like, Mm -hmm. I don't think you understand. Like, I know your job. But do you know my level of adaptation? Right. My belief system, how focused I'm going to be. I'm going to wake up at three o'clock in the morning. Right. I'm going to go to sleep at 8 p.m. every night. I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to smoke. Yep. I'm going to live a clean life. I got a very small circle of people that support me because they all proved who they are. Mm-hmm. Right. When people show you who they are, you believe them and you solidify it in life. Yep. And that's that's what I've been able to learn is who people actually are from the setback that I went through. And it was a blessing in that I learned where I belong in this life Mm -hmm. and what my primary responsibility is, is to encourage other people to find God and to let them know that even if you have a setback, I can help. You can help. There is help. There's more than us. In fact, there's thousands, mm-hmm. there's millions, mm-hmm. there's more people that are willing to help that even understand their ability to help. It's just getting into the paradigm of, wait a minute, I can help. And then just helping in whatever way you can help. Like maybe it's listening, maybe it's talking, maybe it's just being present. Yep, I, you know, I agree um, that. You know, you touched on that humans thrive in, you know, small groups or groups or whatever it may be. And you might you might have read the book. There's a book called Tribe, and it's by Sebastian Younger, and that his last name spelled with a J, but it explains, you know, kind of the history of why we like to live in small groups and community and in having a a support system and that type of stuff. It's a really good book to read. Um, and and with that, I do want to segue into your book a little bit. And let's talk about basketball strength. Um, is it is is it a guide to getting stronger? Is it a story? Tell me about it. Basketball strength is unique in that uh, I went through high school, college, and overseas pro basketball. Came back here, worked out with some overseas and NBA players, did a bunch of workouts, and realized that a majority of the things that were being done were helping people to get stronger, but they weren't helping people to be better basketball players. Mm -hmm. So what I did is I started to dissect things that were done all together. And then I created a sequence called the swamp lunge. Now everyone knows that a lunge is an exercise that's old as rock, Mm -hmm. but it's not done in the swamp lunge way. The swamp lunge exercise allows me to use one movement as a biomechanic assessment. So an athlete day to day, your body has aches and pains. So you always want to go through some sort of a warm-up checklist to find out where your ankles, knees, hips, back, shoulders, wrists, elbows, like where's everything today? So with the swamp lunge, I was able to put together a format where I would teach 
stride mechanics, biomechanics, and biofeedback at the same time Mm -hmm. while promoting athleticism, explosive training without being explosive. So then this was next level because I started using it on everyone. And this started early in 1997. I perfected it by 2002. What ends up happening is this. As you use this movement and you stay strict to the movement, it teaches you how to move optimally. You'll learn how to walk for the first time properly. People don't know how to walk properly. They think they do, they don't which means they don't run properly, they don't land, they don't jump, skip, hop, gallop, slide. The whole thing is improper. Once the biomechanics are corrected, the body's alignment goes into place. So the first thing I do is I prevent injuries by aligning the body using biomechanics through the swamp lunge. That's the first thing. The second thing that happens through the use of the swamp lunge is you go from an acute stride front leg and acute stride back leg to a right angle stride front leg, right angle stride back leg. It's based on mathematics. Biomechanics is all math. So the longer your strides go away from your body and the finer your movement is, everything about your physicality skyrockets. By the time you get to the obtuse angle stride front leg and the obtuse angle back leg, you're going to be apex for whatever your genetics at this time are allowing you to do. And there's rules. I'll give you an idea. People ask me all the time, how do I jump higher? Basketball strength, do the swamp lunge. Mm-hmm. That's it. Yes, that's it. Why? Biomechanic assessment. Okay, I did it and I felt it in my hamstrings. What's next? That just told you. What do you mean? The biomechanics tells you if your hamstrings are sore, that's where your next focus needs to be. If it was in your quads, you go right to the quads. If you're to glutes, you go right to the glutes. The beauty of it is it's never wrong. Not once yet since 1997, and no one gets hurt. Matter of fact, I've had a lot of players elongate their careers using this thing instead of the traditional squat, leg press, leg extension, leg curl, silly nonsense that's been thrown together for the standard of care since the 1970s. So when I developed this program, it was to save careers and it was to teach people how to move with one exercise that becomes an assessment and then has 24 courses to it. So the movement that goes along with basketball strength, it's an upper body integration I also put the best drills that I've ever learned from the coaches that I've had in that book, which are not very showy drills. You're not going to see them go viral on a reel somewhere or or get like 10 million TikTok views or something like that. But I'll tell you what, I have a factory. The people I work with are fundamentally sound power players and they're a problem. And most of the people that I've worked with have been baseball players. Because the swamp lunge, if you look at a baseball pitcher, Mm -hmm. that leg kick, that stretch, that stride, that push, you're never going to see pitching the same again because it is the swamp lunge. I grew up watching my dad as a major league pitcher. I watched him stride off the mound. I got older and put it all together. Wait a minute. There's something there. How can we do this? Boom. So in essence, a lot of those early seeds were planted by my father pitching major league baseball. Mm -hmm. because I got a chance to see. And then when I trained baseball players, I realized it's a universal application, but the best way for me to present it was by using the fact that I can get my head over the rim and basketball will draw people to me, which will allow me to teach this biomechanics assessment. But what's it really all about? It's my purpose, showing people that I can rise again. So when you look at this picture on this book, you see me way over the rim. And the symbolism there is you can rise it again. You can knock a man down. You can count him out. And he will rise again with the strength of God. And that's where I'm at. The book, it's it's a great offering. It helps everyone that reads it. Mm -hmm. It's definitely something that I would recommend having. No question. Not even necessarily for basketball, just to have in terms of movement. If I would put it in a category... I would say that 
it should be in every master's level, biomechanics, sports science, physical education, or health education program at every college and university in the world. Mm -hmm. That's the level that the educational value is. Like you can read this as a middle schooler or a high schooler and know what to do with it right away. Most of the educational material that exists in college, it's middle school, high school level. It's just expanded upon. We don't really go that far beyond it. And I think that's another thing too. The basics are the best. Yeah. And if you can master those basics, you can, you have a power basic, you're effective. Mm -hmm. And what I do is I help players to be more effective. The number one question I get, and I get this in the thousands, is how can I jump higher? Use the swamp lunge, go through the courses, listen to the biofeedback, mm -hmm. send me a video of you doing it within the one two minute video critique, I can get a person completely shifted into a biomechanic flow where all they have to do is practice exactly what I recommended without even physically being there. And that person's gonna make progress for the rest of their life. Biomechanics is a wellness thing. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not a workout like sets and reps thing. This is, I'm gonna teach you how to move your body so that you can enjoy your body. Right. For the rest of your life. Like, I want you to enjoy it, man. I want you to be doing the things that you want to do the way you want to do them, when you want to do them, and how you want to do them. Mm -hmm. You know, not like doctors telling me you can't play basketball. It's like, thanks, doc. Appreciate it. Right down. <laughs> Remember me when I come back with that picture over the rim. Don't forget this day. Right. Yep. But those are those things. We have to keep that alive. And my program gives hope to people. It helps a lot of people around the world with basketball skills. And I can't wait for the opportunity just to go around the world, almost like Habitat for Humanity, but teaching people how to move and develop basketball programs where they don't have them. And then using basketball and movement as a way to bring in the community and kind of strengthen core values and bring everything together. I think basketball is the glue. Yeah, no, I, I, I like where you're going there. Um, I think you can use, like you said, anything can be the glue. And for you, it's, it's sports. Um, even though sports is not the main focus, the main focus is helping people. You're doing it through basketball. And I love the way you're doing that. Um, you know, we're going to do multiple episodes with you and I'd like to kind of maybe wrap this one up. And then when we get into the next episode, let's start talking about, that journey back, you know, let's start talking about surgery one, surgery two, so you know what I'm saying? And let's, let's start yeah. hammering out that way. Got it. Um, is there, uh, is there anything you want to wrap this up with? I do. I want to thank you for giving me time today and letting us have this forum to help out people and also each other, because this, this is a great way to help each other and also support one another. Um, I also want all the listeners to know that I'm a great resource advocate. You can reach out to me, Coach Lemanchek on IG. Uh, that's the platform I frequent most. And if you need help, reach out, man. If you want to say hi, <laughs> reach out, man. You know, yeah. definitely say what's up. I'm a very reachable person and I'm very thankful to be here. Praise God that I'm here. And thank you, brother. Absolutely, sir. And, and I will link your Instagram in the bio. and. Your book, is your book available on Amazon? I mean, where, where can we find it? We can find this on Amazon. I have Basketball Strength Volume 1 and 2 as eBooks on Amazon. And I also have the Basketball Strength Volume 1 paperback and hardcover on Amazon. Good deal. Um, and, and kind of piggybacking off what Dave said for the listeners, um, reach out. Reach out to him. You've got so many of you guys reach out to me. You know I put my email in all the bios. I'll have Dave's Instagram there. Drop him a message. If you like what he's talking about, you need his help, you just want to talk to him, send him a message. He answered me back almost instantly. So just drop a message and tune in next time, guys, and, and we'll talk more about um, how Dave recovered from these massive injuries and yeah, found himself where he is now. So thanks for tuning in, guys, and we'll see you next time.